Okay, yesterday I said that we would probably finish uh, section 8.7. Uh, that did not happen. Uh, I don't know that, in fact, that will happen today, but we're going to make a good stab at it. And if we do, then we'll get a start in uh, section 8.8. .8. According to the syllabus, we're not necessarily supposed to be done with this uh, binomial series stuff in 8.8 .8 prior to the test on Friday. Uh, that's probably going to be the case. We will probably have started 8.8 .8 and um, we'll just have to clarify what is your responsibility for the test. I can't tell you at this moment. Um, we left a problem uh, set up but pending, so let's finish that. Um, there are a couple of web assigned. Web assigned is due tonight. Is that right? Tomorrow. Okay. So we're still prior to the deadline. There are a couple things that um, Nicole and I talked about as far as web assign problems that are a little um, kind of strange, but once you see what it is that I think they want you to compare it to, uh, it's not necessarily that bad of a problem, but we'll look at some of those web assign problems too. But let's finish. We wanted to find the interval of convergence for the sine function uh, using the ratio test. So we ended class yesterday with this. So let's pick up today. So there is the without the alternating signs part, which is not going to matter because it's absolute value. Um, there's the n plus first term. We're going to take it and compare it using division. to the nth term, and we want to go way out there to the right and see what happens. Uh, let's kind of put stuff where it belongs. 2n plus 3 is up here. 2n plus 3 factorial. We're going to have an x to the 2n plus 1 and a 2n plus 1 factorial. So how can I rewrite some of this stuff so we can evaluate this limit way out to the right? No. Oh, x, 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 x. Okay, let's, let's, seems to be the first thing is to compare these two. So it's going to leave an x squared in the numerator, right? This has x. The power of x here is 2 more than the power of x here. Okay, and how are we going to deal with 2n plus 1 factorial and 2n plus 3 factorial? This seems to be larger, so let's see what that looks like. 2n plus 3, what would be the next one as we work our way back to 1? Next one? And then what? 2n? Back to 1? Kind of lost my 1 there. And then 2n plus 1 factorial is actually part of that, right? 2n plus 1 times 2n all the way back to 1. So it looks like we're going to leave a, what, 2n plus 3 and a 2n plus 2 down here. Is that correct? Because the 2n plus 1 factorial is going to cancel with the rest of those, and we'll leave those two terms down here. So the ends are positive. I think we can bring that part out. And really, we could absolute value of x squared. I don't think we have to worry about that being negative. But what's going to happen to this as n approaches infinity?
what happens to that? That approaches zero, which kind of overtakes this, doesn't it? This x squared. So we've got the whole thing approaching zero, and we would expect the limit, if it converges, to be where? Less than one. I think we're less than one all the time, right? So there's no certain value of x or certain values of x that cause this thing to converge. It converges for all x. So our interval of convergence, I don't think that's a surprise, that this particular uh, Taylor series or Maclaurin series for sine of x converges for all values of x. So if we let it go all the way to infinity, doesn't matter what you put in for x. Uh, the fact that we were stuck with two terms that each had n in them in the denominator basically kind of forced this thing to converge for all values of x. So if we want to put in pi over 3 for x, that's fine. If you want to put in 5 pi over 6, uh, any value you want to for x, and it should converge eventually. Um, if this converges, if the sign converges for all values of x, and we have a way of getting from the sine Taylor series or Maclaurin series to the cosine, which would be what? Taking its derivative, shouldn't it have the same interval of convergence? It should. Or we could validate that the same way we did this, but the, this, we would find the same thing to be true. Um, I can find that sheet. I have a nice summary sheet on intervals of convergence now that we're kind of leaving that. in your book, but it does spell out all the series that we've looked at thus far. The first one was an infinite geometric series. Uh, the first term was 1 and the ratio is x, so that's an a over 1 minus r format. And that's what the series looks like, and there's its interval of convergence because we wanted, what, the absolute value of the ratio to be less than 1. That's where that came from. Let's go to the last one. We did an inverse tangent in pretty much the same way. We developed this one by integrating that, and that we treated as a, a over 1 minus r. The ratio was negative x squared, and then we integrated everything. So that's how we arrived at that, um, the ratio being negative x squared must be less than 1 in absolute value. And then we have to check the endpoints. It just so happened that it converged at the endpoints. I don't know that we ever did that. But it does converge at both endpoints. So those two are the kind of the outliers here in the list. All the rest of them, e to the x, converges for all values of x. Sine of x and cosine of x converge for all values of x. So inverse tangent and this kind of that first infinite geometric series we looked at in terms of a power series. They have a fairly limited interval of convergence. All the others are wide open. Um, I don't want to skip over those um, web assigned questions, so let's go to those and then we'll pick up with the error estimate or the remainder when we stop and have a uh, Taylor polynomial as opposed to a Taylor series. We can get that. What What are the problems that we said we were going to look at? I think it was x to the 3 fifths over n, maybe. Is that the 3 to the n over 5 to the n? That one? Yeah. That would be the one we're talking That's the same one we're talking about? So there is a web assigned problem. If somebody has that handy, there, I think there's a 3 to the n. Uh, there's a 5 to the n. And then there's an n factorial, if I remember right. Does anybody have that? Do you have it, Kelly? Is that the right problem? Yeah. 3 to the n, 
5 to the n and an n factorial? Yes, sir. What number is that? Uh, number 8. Number 8. I've got that. I just written it sideways up there on top. <laughs> All right. Um, this is kind of a, a testy little problem. And I think the next one, is that the natural log of 2 problem? These both kind of fall in the same category. I think they want us to compare this one to this one. What is that one? What's the one on the right? Go ahead. E to the X. That's e to the x. x to the n over n factorial is e to the x. And you could have it in expanded form or the sigma notation closed form. Uh, I think we just looked at this paper right here. There's our definition, or at least in terms of sigma notation, this Taylor series, McLaurin series approach. That's what e to the x is. Three to the n over five to the n, since they're both to the n, you could say that's really three fifths to the n over n factorial. And then it's kind of a comparison and contrast with this thing over here that we know. So when we have an x in this position, x to the n over n factorial, that's e to the x. We don't have an x occupying that position. We have a 3 fifths. So that should be, if everything else is the same, what should this be equal to? E to the 3 fifths. <coughs> so when you see it in that fashion, it's not a, that difficult of a problem. But you've got to say, well, what am I trying to do with this? What am I comparing it to? I'm comparing it with this. Here it's x to the n. Here it's 3 fifths to the n. That's e to the x. This must be e to the 3 fifths. Now, if that's not believable, take your calculator and raise e to the 3 fifths power. Add the first seven or eight terms of this series together and see if they're beginning to mesh. In fact, that might be a good one for us when we talk about error um, to stop it at, let's say, n equals 5, and then we'll try to evaluate what the error might be, what we're missing by not going all the way out to infinity. All right, so that's problem 8. Uh, the very next problem is the one that has natural log. Is that correct? Has the natural log of 2 in it? Yeah. So what's it look like? It's 1 minus natural log of 2 plus natural log of 2 squared over 2 factorial minus natural log of 2 cubed over 3 factorial. OK, thank you. So that's over 1 factorial. Um, let's try to take this same approach on this problem where we've got something to the n. Pretty clearly, it looks like we have n factorial, right, in the denominator. There's a 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial. So the denominator appears to be n factorial. And then we're, as we go off to the right, we're gaining powers of what? What is it that's being raised to higher powers as we work our way to the right? OK. I heard a couple things. I, I heard negative natural log of 2, and I heard natural log of 2. So aren't we, as we work our way to the right, the thing that is raised to higher powers is negative natural log of 2. Here it's to the 0. Here it's to the 1. Here, negative natural log of 2 is squared. That's why it's positive. Now, we could separate out the negative part, 
but I don't think I really want to because I want to compare it to this. So once again, x to the n over n factorial is e to the x. We don't have x to the n, but we do have something to the n over n factorial as n goes from 0 to infinity. So that should be, if this is e to the x, this guy ought to be e to the negative natural log of 2. How's that work? Same thing? Okay, now we've still got a little bit of work to do. Um, <clears throat> when we have e as the base and natural log as an exponent, we really like to have e to the natural log of something. That becomes the something, right? At this moment, we don't have e to the natural log of something. We have e to the negative natural log. We could throw that down to the denominator. That's the easy way out. Let, what can we do with this negative 1 that's out in front? 2 to the negative 1. Right. We can replace it in this position, right? If it's in the exponent position, we can bring it out in front. So if it's out in front, we can put it back, so to speak, in the exponent position. So that negative 1 that's out in front is now the exponent of 2. And what is 2 to the negative first? That's 1 over 2. And what's e to the natural log of something? It is that something. So this problem has an answer of 1 half. So both of these problems kind of force us to compare the given problem with the sigma notation power series for e to the x. We don't have x to the n over n factorial, but we have something to the n over n factorial. Now, was there another problem we looked at, or is the, those are the two that? Anybody else have another web assigned question or issue before we leave that? <coughs> All right, well, if you come across it, bring it up. But let's go on to the remainder. Uh, when we had alternating series, we decided that the error for the sum, even if we stop it, let's say at n equals 7, we're never any further away from the actual infinite sum than the value, the magnitude of the next term, right? So if we stopped at n equals 7, we would want to examine the eighth term um, as far as the error is concerned. This is really not that much different. I need to look at that. Well, I thought I had printed this up, but maybe I didn't. All right, this will get us set up, and we'll just add in what the remainder actually is. <clears throat> so we've got a function. We're going to represent it with a Taylor polynomial. So we're going to stop it at n equals something, n equals 5, n equals 13, whatever. And we know that that's not exactly the sum unless we go to infinity. So there's some remainder or error associated with stopping the Taylor polynomial at n being a specific number as opposed to letting it go to infinity. So T n, T sub n is the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So we're stopping that at uh, I don't want that. Let me see if I can correct it without messing it up too much. Uh, I want to stop it at n, so I can't use n over here. Let's change that to i. So where we had n's before, we're going to have an i. We want to start i at 0 and let it run to n, but we're going to stop it at n. We're not going to take a limit now. We're not letting it go to infinity. 
So we know what that is. That's the Taylor. If A is zero, it's the Maclaurin. If we start it at zero and stop it at N, we've got a Taylor polynomial, not a Taylor series. Uh, if we're going to have some type of convergence, which we don't always have, but for e to the x and sine of x and cosine of x, it's going to converge for all values of x. So if we know it converges, then eventually this remainder that we're deleting, not including as part of the Taylor polynomial, it's going to be minuscule. And in fact, as we work our way further out to the right, <clears throat> the value of this error or remainder gets smaller and smaller and approaches zero if we've got convergence. Uh, what is f? The entire f of x is equal to the sum of its Taylor series. So we've got to let it go all the way out to infinity in order to actually have it equal to the f of x. So let's focus on the remainder associated with having stopped the Taylor series at a specific value of n. So error or remainder for t sub n. So the remainder associated with the nth Taylor polynomial. So I thought I had this printed out, but let me. So we're going to be off by a certain amount. Kind of depends on the nature of the series, but the magnitude of our error, so absolute value. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put in a value that is not the way it's written in the book, but let's talk about what that z actually means. In your book, you're going to see a capital M right here. So we want the maximum value of the n plus first derivative. So we want to know what the error is at its worst. Now I use the z because if we're going to maximize the value of the n plus first derivative, we want to pick a value somewhere between x and a, or possibly x or a. so as to maximize the value of the n plus first derivative. Now, the reason I like to write it like this, because it, to me it reminds me of what we had earlier in the um, alternating series. To me, it looks a whole lot like the next term. If we're stopping at n, then the next term is really n plus 1. So we will have taken the derivative n plus 1 times. We're raising this binomial, x minus a, to the n plus 1. And instead of an n factorial, we have an n plus 1 factorial. So it has that look of the kind of the next term of the Taylor series. We've stopped it at n equals 7. We want to examine the eighth term. It's slightly different because we do want to get a maximized value for the n plus first derivative somewhere in that interval from x to a. It's easy to do with sines and cosines. If you start with a sine or cosine, when you take derivatives of sines and cosines, what do you get? You get cosines and sines. What's the maximum value that you're ever going to get for a sine or a cosine? Is 1. So it's, it's easy with those. You just plug a 1 in here. And then you see what these are like, and that will give you an indication of the maximum value. I mean, the error is probably smaller than that, but this would be the error at its kind of its upper bound. 
So we do want to think of the next term, not 100% the next term because of the way this is handed to us right here. We want to maximize the value of the n plus first derivative in the interval that we're working. Um, let's do that problem that was ended up being e to the three-fifths, and let's see how close we can get. might be a bad problem, but it kind of seems fairly tame. So let's write out the third Taylor polynomial and then we'll see what kind of error is associated with that by examining, for the most part, the next term. Because the function itself is t3 plus the remainder associated with it. And we want to have a maximum value for the error. So what is t3? What's the n equals 0 term? 1? What's the n equals 1 term? And the n equals 2 term? Nine fiftieths. Does that sound right? We've got some agreement. We've got some disagreement. 9 over 50? Right, 9 over 25 over 2, 9 over 50. I don't know why they wouldn't trust you on that. I didn't trust you yesterday on that. Uh, that's for n equals 0 and 1 and 2, so our last term is n equals 3. What do we get? We get a 27. Uh, 5 cubed, 125, and that's divided by 750. Somebody take your calculator if you have it out and ready and working, and let's see what we have so far. We know if we did the whole Taylor series, the sum all the way out to infinity was supposed to be what? E to the three-fifths, somebody take that and figure that out on a calculator as well. We're not always going to have the luxury of knowing what the sum is all the way out to infinity, but we do on this problem. What is this? And if we let this thing go all the way out to infinity, so we're not doing too badly. But again, most of the time you don't know how you're faring. We just happen to have the luxury of knowing what this is. So we want to find the remainder associated with this third Taylor polynomial. So we want the fourth derivative of our function, right? The n plus first derivative. Uh, evaluated at, well, we want to maximize the value of the fourth derivative. Let's just leave it at that. We don't really have a, um, kind of used this to get our answer. So let's see if we can use that in comparison to help us find the error over n plus 1 factorial, which would be 4 factorial. Um, normally, it's x minus a, the absolute value of x minus a, to the n plus first. So for us, 
let me just put these. Um, how are we going to do that? At zero. So our A value is zero, right? Because we have it technically in x minus zero to the n in this problem. So we have a, we plugged in a three-fifths where there was an x, but that was an x, which was an x minus zero. So we're going to do the fourth derivative at zero. And this will become an x minus zero to the fourth, right? Now let's fill in. Go ahead. This is really what we use to kind of pattern this after, is really 1 over n factorial x minus 0 to the n. So our a value is really 0. Um, I'm going to make a change in that, because that's not exactly, that's not kind of our final resting place, but I'm putting that in there because that was our a value. So that's a kind of a placeholder right now. But I think it's what we want here, and I think it's what we want here. We do want a fourth derivative. Fourth derivative of what, by the way? E to the, e to the x, right? And then we're going to let x be 3 fifths when we're done. So our fourth derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The question is, do we really want to evaluate this at 0? Well, we want to evaluate it. This z value that I wrote earlier is the value in our interval. What's our interval? Our interval is between x and a. In this case, it's between 0 and 3 fifths. that's going to maximize the value of this term. So do we know what the fourth derivative is? We do. It's e to the x. Do we know what x is? x in this problem is, what did we do for x? Where we saw in x, we put in a 3 fifths. 3 fifths minus 0, so that's 3 fifths. Now the question is, we want to maximize that n plus first derivative by putting in a value either 0 or 3 fifths or some value between 0 and 3 fifths. Where is that? That's an element of, yes. Right. So z is going to be chosen somewhere in that interval or either of the endpoints. So do I choose 0 or 3 fifths or some value between 0 and 3 fifths so as to maximize the value of the fourth derivative? Well, x to the 0, x to the 3 fifths, which is larger? x to the 3 fifths? I mean, not x to the 3 fifths, e to the 3 fifths, sorry. So we have a choice, 0 or 3 fifths or any value in between, because we want to maximize the value of the fourth derivative. Then it's arithmetic from here. 3 to the fourth, 81. 5 to the fourth, that's 25, 625. All that over 4 factorial, which is 24. So this is an upper bound for our error. We know we don't have much error. In fact, the error looks like it's, what, 0 0.006, possibly. We're probably going to get a value that's a little bit larger than that here. You're never going to get the exact error, because if you did, then you'd get, you'd be able to add it to the Taylor polynomial, and you'd have the exact value. It's an upper bound for the error. No. Isn't it going to create a problem, though, that to solve for the error? You yes, have it does. To yeah. Thing. yeah. It's got a kind of a embedded issue that we're, here we are trying to find e to the 3 fifths, and we've got to use e to the 3 fifths to find it.
and there are other kind of embedded problems in the book. I've actually kind of skipped over them because um, there's another one that forced us to find E squared. Well, if we could find E squared for a Taylor polynomial for E, it almost kind of defeats the purpose. So, yes, there, that, that to me is a problem. We kind of glaze over that now because we have this nice little machine that we pop in E to the three-fifths and we don't think much about it. But this is supposedly, even though it's got a, kind of an embedded problem in there, supposed to be an upper bound for the error. I don't think we're going to go wrong. If E to the three-fifths is really a major issue here, we could probably not be in trouble by going E to the zero. That's much easier. And then this term would become 1 as opposed to 1.822. I don't, let's just see what happens when we do that. With this, the, ra the way it's written, what do we get? Did you run that through, Katie? 0.0098. Okay, which we know that's larger than the error because we can compare this thing to this thing and we know it's 0 0.006. Let's see what happens if instead of using e to the 3 fifths, we use e to the 0, which is 1. So it's just 81 divided by 625 times 24. It's probably a more realistic approach to this, actually. What is that? OK, not enough, probably. So. A According to what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to maximize the value of the fourth derivative. Unfortunately, putting in e to the zero doesn't maximize the value of the fourth derivative. So as e, as, even though that's easier, it's probably not going to suffice in this problem. Yeah, I also see that as a potential flaw in this situation. But in magnitude, our error is slightly less than that. But that's an upper bound for the error. OK, we can, I think, start this next section. Did you come up with another problem, or are we OK with the ones we looked at? Anybody else? Gosh, we've been on 8.7 for, what, three weeks now? Maybe we can actually go on to the next section. I kind of had an idea this would happen, which is why I've tried to keep us a slightly ahead on the syllabus, because I knew when we got to 8.7 especially, yeah, we're not done yet with 8.7. Sorry, I just thought of another problem. <laughs> um, probably the last thing in 8.7, let's go ahead and just decide that it is the last thing, is the product of <clears throat> Taylor series or quotient. So let's say we had e to the x and we wanted to multiply it by sine of x. And we wanted to see what that looked like in terms of a, <clears throat> of a power series. e to the x, somebody tell me what that looks like, the first few terms of e to the x. Well, it's x to the n over n factorial. So 1 plus Here's the problem with products of power series is that you've got these dots out here. Sine of x, what is that? Well, sine is even or odd? Sine is an odd function, so what's it look like as it progresses? 1. Now, 1 would be inherently even, right? Because it's x to the 0 over 0 factorial, so that's even. So it's x to the 1 over 1 factorial. OK, and now we're rolling. Again, the confounding part is the dot, dot, dot. So if we're doing a multiplication, why don't we do kind of a distribution, one term at a time, 
and when we stop seeing those terms in that column, then that column is pretty safe. We're on to the to the higher orders, higher powers of x. So if we take, let's take this x and distribute it to each one of these. What do we get when we take x and distribute it to each one of these terms? Everybody all right with that? Now, we could do more of that, but I, I, we're trying to stabilize the first few terms of this series. Let's actually, let's get one more. So it'd be x to the fifth, four factorial, and that's going to go on. So we're done with that one. Now let's distribute this and make sure we keep things in the right column. So we've got a constant column, which we don't have an occupant of that right now. And we're not going to have one, right? Our x to the first column, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. So what happens when we multiply this guy by this guy? So I want to line up my x cubes to keep track of them. Uh, what's the next one? Minus? x to the fourth, so I'm lining my x to the fourths up over 3 factorial. This guy times this guy minus x to the fifth over 3 factorial minus x to the sixth over 3 factorial, and so on. So we're done with that one. Let's go on to this one, and then we'll kind of see which ones have actually stabilized. So this one times this one. Over 5 factorial <laughs> plus x to the seventh. Um, something happened here. I'm not liking this column. Are we okay? We lost our factorials, didn't we? Let's revisit this one. I'm not, that's not sitting real well with me. So we took this one times this one. There, we're good. This times this, same denominator. What should this denominator be? Three factorial, two factorial. And this one should be three factorial. 3 factorial, right? Lost some of the terms in the denominator. All right, now we're back to this one. This guy times this one. We did this one times this one. Now we have x to the seventh over what? And x to the eighth over 5 factorial, 3 factorial. Now, is 5 factorial times 2 factorial, is that 10 factorial? No. no. Well, we could call it that, but we kind of like to get things right. So when I say things are starting to stabilize, our first term, there's going to be no other occupants, right, of that first column. X is the only one. So we're not going to write it all, but let's start to write what this series is. <coughs> it's x. We've got an x squared. We aren't going to have any other members of that one. Uh, how many x cubed do we have? And w will we have any other terms that will occupy this column? That's it, isn't it? Everything else that we come across will be of higher power. So how many x cubed do we have? Well, here's a half x cubed. And we're losing a sixth, is that right, of x cubed? So what's our final count for x cubed? What's a half minus a sixth? A third? Uh, x to the fourth, are we stable there? We're not going to have any more? Okay, so what is our, we've got a one-sixth x to the fourth, 
and then we're going to, so we lose them, yeah. right? We lose that term. Uh, and then you kind of keep going with this process. I know it seems kind of antiquated, but you can figure out a power series for a product of two power series, but it's a little tedious to do that. And you could, in a similar fashion, I'm trying to avoid this one actually, uh, set up a long division problem. That would actually be worse because then you'd have to, of the term that you're dividing through into the other one, you're going to have to see how many times you think it will go through. There's actually a um, long division problem set up top of page 615 where they have, um, they wanted a Taylor series for the tangent. Well, we have one for the sine, we have one for the cosine. Let's see what it looks like when we divide. Um, we can, I mean, it's not as, it's not ridiculous, but it's, I wouldn't classify it in the fun column. Again, the dot, dot, dots really enter in here. So that would be the divisor, which in this case is the cosine. We want sine over cosine. And in under here, we want the sine, sine divided by cosine. So like you would do any long division problem, you would say, how many times does 1 go into x? And then you say, well, that's x if we're trying to keep things lined up. And now you do the process where you take x times the 1, bring it down, x times minus 1 half x squared, which is what? And you continue that process for as many of these as you have. And what do you do with this stuff? that you bring down, you subtract x minus x. They drop out. You've got this minus a negative, so you're going to have some x cubes. Then what do you do? Then you again take 1 into the x cubed, write it up here. So it's, it's kind of the same. It's a little more tedious, I guess, to do the long division, which gets confounded by how many terms you actually include and how many you're deleting. But power series can be multiplied and can be divided. All right, now we're done. We will not do anything else with 8.7. We will start 8.8 .8 tomorrow. <laughs>